I guess, Aaron, first off, uh, congratulations uh, on what I would assume would be realizing a dream playing in a regular PGA Tour event. And now that you've had uh, 48 hours or so uh, to decompress, uh, uh, what were your uh, thoughts and highlights of what went down in Hamilton on the weekend? Yeah, it was it was a very fun week. Um, had some family and friends come out and just to have the experience with everyone was, was really cool. It was a, uh, it was a great atmosphere out on the golf course. There was, there was a lot of people um, on Saturday. I was in the group behind Justin Thomas and I'm like the 15th hole. I was looking up the fairway and it was like five deep on both sides and he hit it close and like the roar was loud. Um, so it was, it was really fun and it makes me want to get back there. Would it be, I mean, you know, you've had a couple of top five finishes uh, on the European tour uh, you know, you've made seven of 11 cuts. Is it too early to say this is a breakthrough year for Aaron Cockrell or can you even allow that to enter into your mindset right now? Yeah. I mean, that's probably fair. I, that's two of my best finishes came within a five week stretch or something like that. So, um, yeah, it's probably the best season that I've had as a pro. Um, and for him to happen at the start of the year is nice. It kind of relieves a little bit of the pressure the rest of the year. And that way, you know, even things like last week, I was able to play in the Canadian Open and not worry about having to play over on the European Tour that week. Um, so, yeah, it's been a great season. And every year as a pro, I, I probably have gotten slightly better. Um, and I'm just trying to continue that. And this year has definitely been my best year yet. So just looking to keep building on it. You talked about walking up the I, I forget what hole you're talking about with Justin Thomas there and that sort of thing. You know, what is it about that, that roar that you hear that, you know, you probably don't get that as much on the European tour. Um, the crowds probably aren't just as big and that sort of thing. What, what, how, how is that motivating for, for a golfer? Yeah, it's, it's fun. It makes you want to play in that atmosphere more often. Like the, the 15th hole, the par five, and then the next hole was the rink hole, the par three, that was kind of like the waste management deal. There was, you know, thousands of people around. It was like playing a hole, hole in a hockey rink. Um, it's just, it's really fun to, to play in that atmosphere. I mean, we get it a little bit on the European tour, but probably not quite to that scale. Um, and then especially being a Canadian in the national open was even the bigger scale for me last week. Um, so you just, you, yeah, you just, it was, it was a lot of fun and you want to get back and do it again. Aaron, uh, were you still there uh, on the course uh, when Rory was finishing up on 18, and there was that mass of humanity coming up the fairway to circle the green. Were you able to soak in and experience all of that as well? So I, I teed off the other nine. So I had finished, I'd finished my round like half an hour, 45 minutes before they were finishing up. So we were in the clubhouse eating, but the way that the clubhouse looks over the 18th hole, you could see everything. And so we, we saw it from inside looking out and it was, it was wild. <laughs> It was pretty cool how they let them all come up. I think that's something that golf should do more often. It creates a pretty cool little atmosphere. Yeah, no, no doubt about that. Uh, now, you're not obviously a regular member on the PGA Tour. You want to get there one day. Uh, and I don't know how much talk there has been on the European Tour uh, about the uh, the Live Tour, but th did he hear a lot of conversation about that? I mean, Rory McIlroy, uh, <laughs> when he was being interviewed on the green after the tournament, uh, certainly made his feelings known and in the uh, post-tournament press conference as well. Did you hear... Was there a lot of conversation uh, on the course uh, and some that you can share with us? I mean, it's like, it seems like that's all guys talk about now um, in, in the lunchroom when you're in the gyms and everything, it's kind of always a constant chatter, but then guys don't talk about it as much <laughs> when there's cameras and stuff on them. Um, <laughs> but yeah, it's like, it's, I don't know if anything has happened, like nothing has happened like this in golf in my lifetime. Like if, if you follow golf closely, this would be like, I don't know, the Saudis trying to pay like Kyle Connor and the boys to go over and start a new league and recruit players to play in another league. So like, it's, it's pretty wild what's actually happening. Um, and it seems like they're gaining some steam and the money is just so big that some guys are going to go play. And I mean, they've, they just got Bryson and they're getting some big names and it's going to be wild to see what happens. I think it, what's going to, Hap, it, what's going to depend on is the majors and the world ranking points. So if guys can still get world ranking points by playing in these events, they're going to play them just, just because of how much money it is. And then they'll still be able to qualify for the majors. But now I've heard rumblings that maybe these guys are going to apply for membership on our tour. Um, 
because the PJ tour has banned them. So maybe they'll play X amount of events on the live tour and maybe play the few big events that we have, like the Irish open, the Scottish open. Um, we still haven't heard anything from Keith Pelly, which is a bit shocking. Um, I'm supposed to fly to Munich next week. We have a tournament and I looked at the entry list today and there was like 10 guys who played last week in London who are signed up to play our event, like Keimer and Sergio and these types of guys. Um, so I have no idea what's going to happen and it's getting pretty close. So we, we got to find out something soon here. <laughs> Golf seems like such a tradition sport and, and, and I don't know, value. I don't know. I, I don't really know what the word is, but it just, I'd imagine for a young guy kind of coming up, trying to make it to the tour, it's a bit of a piss off to see these guys just kind of go somewhere else, you know, just yeah. whatever. I mean, for a guy like in my position, you could, I could almost look at it another way where it open, it could open up more spots on the tour if the PJ tour is banning these guys. And, sure. you know, for, for a guy who's made, you know, hundreds of millions to get a little bit more, it does seem a little bit aggressive, but for, for guys <laughs> who are starting out that I know, like a guy who I've played with many times in the European tour this year, he he's done well in the sunshine tour. So it got him into the first event. He finished second. The kid made 3 million bucks. He's, he's from South Africa. He's 23 years old. Like it's life changing for him. So you see that side of it and that's pretty cool to see. So yeah, there's a bunch of different uh, angles you could take on it, but it's, it's, it's yeah. <laughs> you talked a little bit about the BMW invitational, obviously a big tournament, um, for you, you're in the field. Uh, you know, it, it, it's been a weird few weeks because you, you go from, uh, well, Hamburg, I, I believe it was. You come over here, and then I guess you get this week off, so it's the time to you kind of rest or whatever. Um, and that, you know, just what, what's what's the European tour like? Uh, you know, just kind of moving around from country to country, playing in, you know, some pretty nice-looking golf courses and that sort of thing, nice tracks. That sort of thing. Just what's that whole, what's it been like on the European tour? It's awesome. I, I love it. I mean, when, when you're, once you get into Europe in the summer, it's great. The travel is pretty easy around Europe. You can take trains or one hour flights. Um, at the start of the year, we usually start in the Middle East and South Africa, and that's a bit more of a disaster getting around. Um, but once you're in Europe, it's, it's amazing. Like I'm from small town just outside of Winnipeg here yeah. where all we have is a jail and, you know, there's not even like, a four, <laughs> top nine, four ways or lights or anything so I've gotten to go to 30 plus countries in the last couple of years that I otherwise would never have gone to um and we we try and make the most of it and see things on the Monday to Wednesday when you're not playing go and see something in the city and explore a little bit um and so just just trying to make the most of it and have fun you know every time we go Ooh, I just got an email from Keith Pelly good timing <laughs> you want to oh, read it <laughs> uh, Aaron, just for clarification uh, purposes, are you uh, talking to us from uh, Stony? Uh, yeah, well, I, we live in Winnipeg now, so I, I grew okay. up. Okay, gotcha. Yeah, yeah. For a couple of years. Right on. Yeah, it just—I know one of the highlights, certainly uh, something that caught a lot of people's attention in this city and province uh, during the Canadian Open was uh, when you were spurt, uh, sporting the number eighty-one jersey. Uh, now, did you have your choice of jerseys? Uh, was that your preference, or uh, you know, how did that all come about? Yes, yeah, Con Connor's jersey. Yeah, they told us before the tournament what the the rink was going to be like and the atmosphere, and we're kind of encouraging you to throw on a hockey jersey, and so. Um, I, I had played with Kyle last year and um, I guess a sponsor of mine, the financial manager connection to Kyle. He's one of his clients. And um, so I, I got a jersey from him and uh, yeah, see if I can maybe get, get Kyle to sign it and do something with the jersey afterwards. But uh, yeah, it was, it was fun to throw it on. There was a couple of boos the first days uh, for, from some <laughs> crazy Leafs fans uh, who were intoxicated. And uh, on, on Sunday, though, they were uh, appreciative and uh, got a few more cheers that day. <laughs> Yeah, time it couldn't be better with them coming off the Lady Bing too, eh? Yeah, it's perfect. Aaron, let me throw one in at you. Was there a uh, a kind of an aha moment at all, like where you felt okay, I'm finally here on the PGA Tour? Uh, yeah. I mean, the first day I I teed off so late. I like we talked that morning, Lindsay. Like it was just a lot of time to kill, so I was pretty nervous the first day because he had nothing to do all morning. Um, and then I I didn't play great, and but I played solid the, the next day, and so. I think after the second round, when I, when I just played solid, played my game and I was kind of in a decent position, you know, I was in like 20th place. I, I thought maybe that was kind of it that if 
I know if I play well that I can compete against those guys. Um, you know, only having a one, one week chance golf is, is so random, right? You could have a great week. You could have a bad week. So one week is kind of hard to draw a lot from it, but I know just from those kind of first couple of rounds, if I, if I play well, I can compete against those guys if I had more opportunities. So that was uh, a confidence boost. And just to follow up to that, has it sunk in that you've played your first week on the PGA tour yet? Uh, yeah, not really. I was, uh, I was shoveling soil yesterday and uh, doing yard work and cutting the grass. So uh, didn't really have too much time to think about it. I don't know, but uh, I guess it probably will sit in the next few weeks. It was, it was an awesome, awesome experience.